Deuteronomy, Moses is continuing in one of his other sermons. It's a series of sermons that Moses is telling to this new generation, this younger generation of Israelites. And they're there at the foothills of the mountains. The Jordan River is right there. They're in this valley and they're looking at the promised land. Moses is still going through his practical concerns as Warren Wiersbe would put it in his outline. And here he has a practical concern for them that when they go into this land, they are to conquer and utterly destroy the inhabitants of the land. They still have not entered, yet God tells them it's not a question of if the Lord will bring them into the land, but when the Lord brings them into the land and when the Lord your God delivers them over to you. We can consider Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, how Paul tells us being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is the one. Jesus is the one that has begun that work, and he's going to be the one that will be faithful to complete that work in us. Now, it's very important for us to realize, was the nation of Israel greater or stronger than these seven nations? No. It flat out tells us that. But was the Lord their God greater and stronger than these seven other nations? Yes, absolutely. And the same is true for us. The sins we go through and the difficulties we go through. Our enemy, Satan himself, they are far greater and stronger than us. And if we try to come against our sin and come against the enemy in our own strength and in our own flesh, we will, we will utterly fail and fall. But if we go in the strength of the Lord, in His might, in His spirit, and in His word, we will have that victory over sin and over the difficulties that we go through in our flesh. God warns them here. He's going to bring them into the land, but it was on them to conquer and utterly destroy the inhabitants of the land. They were to make no covenants and they were to show no mercy towards the inhabitants of Canaan. For us, this is a picture of sanctification. Sanctification. We're not just to be saved and stay as an infant in the faith until we see Jesus face to face. We are all to be continually growing and maturing in the things of Jesus Christ. We're not to trust in our flesh or in our own strength to defeat sin. Nor are we to think that we're strong enough to play around with sin and not completely destroy it. We've been called to completely and utterly destroy the sins and temptations and the things which so easily ensnare us. We can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul gives us great hope because each and every one of us are tempted. Temptations will come. And the Lord gives us power to overcome these temptations. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 and 13, it says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands... Take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We never sin because we don't have a choice or an option. Every time we sin on this side of salvation, we are making a choice and a decision to sin. It doesn't just magically happen. You don't just fall. It's not, I just slipped and fell and this happened. No, we make a decision to do so. And each and every temptation, God and the Holy Spirit gives us a way out. He will deliver us from sins and the weights in our spiritual lives. But then it's on us to continually conquer them and to utterly destroy them. We need to, as 1 Timothy 6.12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called. 
We need to be living the life to which God has called us to. And the way we do so is by fighting the good fight of faith. David Guzik, he says, on conquering them and utterly destroying them, yet God would not do it all for them. The extent of the work would depend on their faithful response to what God would do. Utterly destroy them, nor show them mercy. Many of us, truth be told, simply do not want to completely destroy the sins which keep us from God's promised land of blessing and peace. We want to weaken them and we want to have some control over them, but we do not want to utterly destroy them. Family, are there, are there sins that you are keeping around? You've been able to shrink them down. God has given you power over them. But you are keeping, in, in case of emergency, break glass portion of sin. Uh, there, there's pastors that have gone through this. I think of Pastor Danny Hodges and how he mentioned he always keep some little measure of these besetting sins behind. And it ended up costing him the ministry and so much. Thank God the Lord's restored him. But many Christians, we do the same thing. Maybe it's a relationship. Why don't you just delete all the phone numbers? Delete them off the face of any of your technology. But is that what we do? No. We keep some way, some trail to get back to those things that we know can and will destroy us. We need to be careful thinking that we're strong enough to handle a certain amount of sin and temptation. We need to utterly destroy it and continually conquer it. Then in verse 3 through 5, he warns them. Do not make marriages, do not give your daughter to their sons, nor their daughters for your son, because they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. As parents, we have to be so careful. We have to be conscious of what we're allowing into our homes and where we are sending our kids. Are we sending them in a path that will turn their hearts away from the Lord God that we serve? We have to be so careful of this. Verse 5, he gives us the recipe. He says, this is how you're going to deal with them. Destroy their altars, break down their sacred pillars, cut down their wooden images, and burn their carved images with fire. God commanded Israel to be merciless with the inhabitants of Canaan, to not marry them, to not have anything to do with them. And our God, he calls us to be merciless with our sin and with our flesh. So often believers are making excuses and reasons for their quote-unquote freedom in Christ. And then anyone that wants to live this radical lifestyle of holiness, they're deemed as either judgmental or they're just too harsh. They're just taking it too serious. Again, how serious do you take poison in your life? How serious do you take poison in your life? Do you get a little bit of poison? You get three cups. You spin them around each day for dinner, right? And you see which is the right one? And no, we keep it in its own spot. We put these childproof caps on it that even the adults have a hard time opening sometimes. Because we want to protect ourselves from taking in any type of poison. And if we know that the wages of sin is death, how much more should we be merciless? towards our flesh, towards temptation, and towards sin. You see, not marrying the people of Canaan had nothing to do with their race or pigment. However, it had everything to do with religion and spiritual reasoning. Here we quickly see missionary dating is not biblical. Just because it worked for your mom and dad does not mean that it's biblical, right? You always have that one person that says, hey, it worked for me, right? Whatever the case. It's not biblical, it is not biblical. We can remember in Numbers 25 how Balaam instructed the king of Moab to send the beautiful women down to the camp of Israel, knowing that the Israelites would fall in love with them and then quickly join in with their idolatry. This is why God instructs us to destroy, break down, cut down, and burn it all down because we are prone to wander. We're prone to wander. We sing that, that hymn, Lord, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. 
We're not prone to be faithful. We are prone to wander. That's why we're commanded over and over and over again, be faithful. Live a life of faith. We are prone to wander. And this is found all over Scripture, this great warning. A couple of scriptures and then we'll camp out a little bit in 1 Corinthians. In Proverbs 13 verse 20, it says, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 and 34, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And we'll see how serious we should take sin in our lives and sinful people in our lives. We're we're about to see. We're not called to start a commune and just disappear from Miami and people in Miami. We're called to be holy in spite of the people in Miami. However, we need to be mission-minded when we are with unbelievers. Dangerous things happen to believers when we are not mission-minded. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul tells them, Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unclean. For indeed Christ is our Passover, was sacrificed for us a little leaven a little bit of leaven it leavens the whole lump so when we allow sin into our lives when we watch certain movies that are bringing in these images when we're listening to certain music that's putting these words in our mind it is slowly but surely leavening the whole lump it's the same for a people group i can always think of the youth even the young adults one person drastically will change a group Any teachers here? Any teachers? Does not one student drastically change how the whole class acts? That one kid, that special kid, right? That kid that was me back in high school, right? That when that kid's absent, all of a sudden all the kids are behaving perfectly. They're a bunch of little angels. But when that one kid gets back, it's insane what has happened. Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, right? Because a little bit of leaven, it leavens the whole lump. Who are the people you're allowing into your life that are drastically changing you? Not for the better, but for the worse. Revelation 18 verse 4, we're commanded. It says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins. We need to come on out. We're called to be holy. We're called to be set apart, lest we share in their sins. Verse 6 Why should this be our attitude towards sin? Why was this supposed to be the attitude for the children of Israel? Because they are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. A special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Israel was called to be holy. They were called to be set apart, different from the entire world around them because they were chosen by God. And because they were the chosen people of God, they were a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. As believers, we're called to be holy, to be set apart. And this is why the nation of Israel had no business wandering around aimlessly with the Canaanites. And it is why we as believers, Christians, disciples, heaven-bound people, we are also that holy people because we're chosen people and we should not just be wandering around aimlessly with unbelievers. But we ought to be mission-minded. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter tells us you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. And what's our purpose? That we may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now 
have obtained mercy. We're called to be set apart. We're set apart for God, and we're set apart for the work of God. Are we proclaiming the praises of God? How he's called us out of darkness. How he's brought us into the light. How he's adopted us as sons and daughters. It tells us here that the nation of Israel was a special treasure, is a special treasure above all the peoples of the earth. And 1 Corinthians 6.20 tells us that we were bought at a price. And because we were bought with such a great price, we are to glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which belong to God anyway. Once again, we are a holy people. We are to be set apart for the purposes of God. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. It says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We have been called to be set apart. And because we've been purchased with such a great price, because we are the temple of God, we have no business fellowshipping with lawlessness and being with unbelievers and touching what is unclean. Right? Imagine if you would, if you finally saved up enough money for your absolute dream car, whatever that dream car is, right? Maybe you have that Lamborghini in mind, that Bugatti in mind, whatever it is, that Porsche. You have that car in mind. Would you take that car to a demolition derby? Would that be the car you choose? You know what? Let's see if I can win this demolition derby, right? No, because even if you win, what's going to happen to your car? It's going to get wrecked. We have no business constantly meandering and being with unbelievers and being in sin and being with what is unclean. We've been called for a holy purpose. We are to be the salt and the light of this world. And it's a much more difficult task to be with them, but yet not be with them. To be among them, but not to be with them. And that's what we've been called to do. It's not called, okay, we got 10 acres here at church. We're going to start a commune. Let's have a six-foot fence. Let's go for a 16-foot high fence, right? And we'll just do everything here at church. Not at all. We've been called to be the salt and the light of this world. We've been set apart not to just hide from this world, but to proclaim the praises and the goodness and the love of God that he's bestowed upon us. In John 17, verse 15, notice Jesus' prayer for us. He says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We are in this world, but we're not of it. Just as Jesus was in this world, and yet he was perfect and sinless. And the key to this for us, it's there in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Family, how often are you taking in the truth of God's word in your life? I pray that each of us, you're, you're taking a shower on a consistent basis, right? As a pastor, that's my prayer for you, right? Each of us, we should be showering on a consistent basis. Are we allowing God's word to sanctify us? To cleanse us? Or do we just turn on the shower, we jump in and jump out and that's it? Okay, I did it. 
That's what a child does, right? Or at least a middle school boy. That's what they do, right? They just turn on the water. They sort of sit in the bathroom, splash them on. Hey, mom, I showered, right? Is that what we're doing with God's word? Or are we allowing his word to sanctify us and cleanse us and wash us and renew our minds? We go back to 7 and 8 of Deuteronomy chapter 7. And I love this. Why did God choose you? Why did God pick you? Why did God save you? The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. We, just like the nation of Israel, our flesh and pride constantly searches for this great reason why God chose us and saved us. Maybe you think it's because of your good looks. Maybe you think it's because of your spiritual gifting. Maybe you think it's because of what you can accomplish for God. No, friend. God saved us. God set his love upon us. God chose us in spite of who we are, in spite of what we've done. God did not love the nation of Israel because of their size or their strength or their power or their righteousness. God, in fact, loved them in spite of all these things. You turn to the chapter, two chapters to the right in Deuteronomy chapter 9. I love the, the bluntness of Scripture. And even the heroes of the faith, each of the heroes of the faith have these great lapses in judgment. Each of these great heroes in faith have so many weaknesses. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 5 it is not because of your righteousness or the uprighteousness of your heart that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Notice verse 6. Therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess, because of your righteousness, in fact, you are a stiff-necked people. That's who we are. We're stiff-necked. We are hard-headed. That's who we are. So few of us came to the Lord the first time we ever heard the gospel. Are there not many of us that we came to church one Christmas, then the next year we came, then the next year we came, and then 20 services in, then we finally, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to Jesus, right? So many of us are so hard-headed. And then even afterwards, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. No, she has to submit to me, right? We're hard-headed. We are a stiff-necked people. And yet God loves us. He bestows his love upon us. Many of us here, we've been prodigals. Many of us here, we were once at church, and then we left. And then by the grace of God, He's chosen us, and he's loved us. And for us, it is completely unearned and completely undeserved. And we should take pride in that fact. God's love towards me is completely unearned and completely undeserved. And because of that, I want to serve him more. Because of that, I want to obey him more. Because of that, I want to be faithful to him and his word all the more. The Wyclef Bible Commentary on God's Choosing of Israel says the following, It flowed from the sovereignty of God's grace so that Israel had no claims upon him that might encourage carelessness with respect to his covenant demands and sanctions. Carelessness with respect to his covenant demands and sanctions. Family, are we not often careless when it comes to the things of God? Are we often careless with respect to God's covenant with us and his commands upon our lives? Are we often not careless? Our pride creeps in and we can begin to think, I deserve this. 
I've done enough of the Christian walk so now I can do a couple bad things and it's going to be A-okay. I, I've given enough tithe to the church so now I can get away with this sin or that sin. That, that's pride creeping in. That's believing that we deserve this. We've worked for this. We have somehow earned this. And it is all the love of God. I encourage you, spend time tonight and tomorrow morning and every morning and every night meditating on the undeserved and unmerited love of God and love of Jesus Christ for you. Sit back and just meditate on it. How many times we've done something that should negate any chance we have at salvation. And yet his grace and his mercy just pours out once again. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it tells us, In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Finally, Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, when we truly believe that God loves us, and that we've done so much to not deserve this great love towards us, it stirs us up. It stirs up a fuel. It stirs up a great motivation to obey God and to utterly destroy anything that would hurt Him and anything that would hurt our relationship with Him. When we truly believe, I don't deserve this. This is His grace and His mercy. We don't think, what's the least amount that we can do for God? We say, what more can I do for the Lord my God? What more can I do for him? How else can I show him how grateful I am for him? You take that with the fact that there's treasures that await us in heaven that are dependent on our works here on earth. It should fuel each of us to be about our father's business. A gratitude for what God has done for us and an eye that's focusing on the rewards of eternity. You look at the life of Paul, he's constantly between the two, grateful and blown away at the grace of God, and then he's considering the rewards that await in heaven for those who are faithful and for those who are about their father's business. Verse 9, therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. You've ever heard one of those, I got good news, bad news, right? Which one do you want first? Here we get the good news. The God of Israel, he is the one true God. And he is the only faithful God because he is the one true God. And he always keeps his covenants and his promises. We can be reminded of the last chapter in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. How the Lord speaks to Israel and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And the way we demonstrate that we have this love for God is through our actions. I'm sure many of the spouses here, many of us here, we've told someone, actions speak louder than words. Don't just tell me that you love me. Show me. Show me that you love me. Show me that you're actually sorry. Jesus, he tells us in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Don't just say that you love me. Don't just show up to church. It's important. I'm glad that you're here at church. I know that God's happy you're here at church. But if you love him, we need to keep his commandments. And when we keep his commandments, he's going to keep that covenant, and he's going to have mercy upon our lives for forever. That's what's meant by a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. You see how those two are joined together? It's those who love him and those who keep his commandments. However, in verse 10 and 11, now we get the bad news. He repays those who hate him to their face. He's not backhanded about it. It is to their face. To destroy them. 
and he will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, in view of this, what should you do? You should keep the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which I command you today to observe them. If those who love God obey his commandments, what do you think is the response from those who hate God towards his commandments? Disobedience. They, they don't obey it. But it's a little bit scarier than that. In Psalm 81 verse 15, it says the following, The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. If you're a little bit slow like I am, the NASB helps out. It says, those who hate the Lord would pretend obedience to him, and their time of punishment would be forever. You see, that word hating God, it's not just an outright hatred towards God. There's no doubt that happens in Scripture today. But those who hate the Lord are those that they pretend to obey him. And, and haven't we all been there when we are pretending to obey him? We're pretending that we obey him in front of other people. We're watching something else and we know someone's coming in the room. So we grab our Bible and we just open it somewhere. Pretending that we're doing our devos, right? Someone, I'll never forget. I was in sixth grade. This is my first missions trip. I'm in sixth grade in my missions trip. We're exhausted. We're sleeping four hours a night. The whole group is tired. And the leader decides, let's have a prayer meeting right now, right? So we're all in this basement. It's all quiet. And I just fall asleep. I'm just knocked out. And he goes and he wakes me up, the pastor's kid that I am. I wake up and right away, without a, without a blink, I go, I was praying. Leave me alone. <laughs> We've all been there, pretending to obey the commandments of God. Are we truly obeying him out of a heart of gratitude and sincerity? Lord, I, I'm grateful. And when we disobey his commandments, we don't hide it. We seek repentance. We repent and say, Lord, I'm sorry. And to the person we hurt, to the person that we disobeyed what God tell, told us to do in that situation, we repent to them as well. Now, verse 12, we see blessings of obedience. It's important for us to know these blessings here. This is not necessarily still applicable to us in every single verse. These blessings of obedience were for the nation of Israel, specifically for their time going in and conquering the nation of Canaan. We'll, we'll see this in a moment. Verse 12 says, Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. And he will love you and bless you. Up until then, it's completely true for every single one of us. Now verse 13, now we get these specific promises for Israel here. He will multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land. Your grain and your new wine and your oil. The increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock. In the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. And the Lord will take away from you all sickness and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known, but will lay on them all those who hate you. Also you shall destroy all the peoples whom the Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eye shall have no pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. The wages of sin is death. If we're obeying any other god, any other idol, it will be a snare in your life. That, that's the only outcome of obeying sin and obeying our flesh and disobeying God's word. It will be a snare for us. Now, these specific blessings, they are for the nation of Israel. We know many godly people who were barren, even in Scripture. We know many godly people that had diseases in Scripture. So this was an incredible blessing for the nation of Israel. And yet, did they obey and stay faithful to the Lord their God? No. They still kept all these different idols. 
We can think of Psalm 144, verse 15. I'll just read that, that last verse. It says, happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Imagine being in a place that the obedience, it causes no barrenness, no sickness, no disease, so much blessing. And it's true in a spiritual sense for us today. That if we're obedient to the word of the Lord, we will not be barren spiritually. We will have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life. If we are obedient to God's word, we won't have the sinful diseases in our lives in a spiritual state. However, there are many promises of obedience for us in the New Testament. And it's not just for this life, it's also for the one to come. In Matthew 12, verse 50... Jesus says, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, my sister, and mother. If we obey God's will, we can know that we are a part of the family of Christ. Luke chapter 6, verse 47. We recently went through this in the book of Matthew. Jesus says, whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the floods arose and the stream beat vehemently against the house, it could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. If we obey Jesus' word, our lives will be built on the deep foundation in the rock, who is Jesus Christ. And when the storms of life come, we will not be shaken. It's an incredible blessing. We know that the storms of life will come. John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus says, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the fathers who sent me. Is this not an incredible promise right here? That if we obey the words of Jesus Christ, God the Father will love us, and God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit will make their home with us. An incredible promise. John 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. It's a promise. If we obey His commandments, we will abide in His love and we will be called His friend. 1 John 2 verse 3 tells us, Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Hey, if we obey God's commandments, we can know that we know that we know that we know Him. And if we know Him, we know that we are heaven bound. Two more promises here before I lose you. 1 John 3 verse 24, it says, He who keeps His commandments abides in Him and He in Him. And by this we know that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. Family, if we obey his commandments, we can know that we are abiding in him and he is abiding in us. And the last promise, one of the biggest ones here, one of the most important ones, is found in Revelation 22, verse 14 and 15. And here it says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life. And may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the sexually immoral and the murderers and the idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. The greatest promise here, I believe, is that if we obey his commandments, we will have a right to the tree of life and we will be in heaven for all of eternity. Hey, that's way better than not having any diseases here on this earth. We jump back to Deuteronomy 7, verse 17. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? 
You shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So shall the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. When fear settles in and you're watching these difficulties in life, what should we say? What should we do? How can I dispossess them? Right? Sometimes uh, the things that we see on the internet, on Facebook, that Christians share, they're a little bit cringy, right? There's this picture every once in a while that Satan whispers into a Christian's ear. Hey, if Satan's whispering in your ear, you're in the wrong place, right? And then it says the Christian whispered back, and the, the Satan whispers into the believer's ear that there's a storm and they're in the middle of the storm. And the Christian whispers back to Satan, I am the storm, right? If you posted that, don't worry. We, we love you. We forgive you. It's all okay. We are not the storm. We are not the storm. We don't want to be in the storm. We want to be with Jesus in the storm. This is the same thing for the nation of Israel. When they're fearful of these nations, what should they do? Should they whisper at these nations, we're stronger than you? We're bigger than you? We're better than you? No, God reminds them, how did you win every other victory thus far? Who won the battle? Was it Israel? No, it was the Lord their God. We are not to trust in our own flesh or in our own strength. We are not the great warrior that's going to defeat Satan. It's going to be Jesus, and Jesus is going to do it with a word. What we have to do is when God puts down sins in our lives, it's to conquer them and utterly destroy them. But when we are fearful of these difficulties in life, when we're fearful and afraid of maybe it's sins or besetting sins, we need to be reminded of what God has done for us in our past, how he's forgiven us. How he's loved us. How he has seen us through greater difficulties. And that's what we, we should be reminded in. That the Lord our God, he's done it in the past. And he's going to do it again. He can do it again. And our God, he's very creative. He's more creative than many of us, right? Verse 20, look how creative the Lord our God is. He says, moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them. Until those who are left who hide themselves from you are destroyed. Is this not like the greatest military like, strength ever? I command the hornets. How can a guy flying an F-16 beat that, right? A bunch of hornets inside the jet with him. Can't do anything about it. He's going to eject. He's going to get out of there. And the Lord, oftentimes, we don't have time to go through it, would win battles and victories for Israel by sending swarms of hornets after the armies. Verse 21 You shall not be terrified of them, for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. And the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you, little by little. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. And family, this is how God works in our life. This is even how the work of sanctification happens in our lives. It's little by little, little by little. Oftentimes we get saved and we're like Peter. Lord, no matter what happens, I'll never leave you. I'd rather die for you, right? And then we stub our toe and we say a bad word. Say, Lord, what happened? I thought I, thought I was super Christian, right? What happened? The Lord, the sanctification work, it's little by little. But, but it's a process that happens and a promise for us. The Lord does this work in our lives Little by little. Just be faithful to him. Verse 23. But the Lord your God will deliver them over to you. And will inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. And he will deliver their kings into your hand. And you will destroy their name from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you destroyed them. You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet The silver or the gold that is on them. Nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Nor shall you bring an abomination into your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. Perhaps some of us here, we struggle with 
true idolatry. We have little idols in our home, perhaps idols that a family or a relative has given to us. But for many of us, those idols, maybe it looks like technology. Maybe it looks like something that's expensive. And instead of just destroying it, we're trying to keep it around because we're coveting the silver or the gold that is in them. Maybe there's something in your life you know you need to destroy, you need to get rid of. But you're saying, man, this, this thing just costs so much. How am I, I going to get rid of it? How am I going to let go of this? Hey, it should be an abomination to you. Get rid of it. Destroy it from your life. We need to abhor what is evil. And we are called to cling to that which is good. That's what we need to do as believers. And yet so many fathers and mothers and sons and daughters are bringing the abominations of the world. And they're bringing them right into their homes. Perhaps it's not a physical idol. Maybe it's something else. But lots of times, I I left myself in my office, right? It's through our, our phone. The things we're watching. The things we let our kids watch. Our kids, we just give them the whole filth of the world, unchecked, unhindered. We struggle with it as an adult. We're addicted to it. But we give it to them without any breaks. And the abominations of this world, they're coming into their eyes. They're coming into their mind. They're coming into our eyes, our mind, our heart. We need to be obedient to Romans 12, 9. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Don't allow the silver or the gold that is on them to ensnare you into keeping it around longer than you should. Get rid of those abominations. Don't bring them into your home. You should utterly detest it and utterly abhor it for it is an accursed thing. That word abhor, it's where we get the the, the idea of something that makes you gag. Something that you just want to vomit out and get rid of. That's how we are to treat sin and abomination. Again, the movies we watch, the things we do, how often we make excuses for, ah, it's not that bad. It's not that big deal. It's just just one word, just one scene, just one cut scene. No, abhor it, utterly detest it. It is not worth it. So, hey, let's go ahead and pray. Pastors, if you guys can come on up. Worship team, if you can come on up. We'll pray. If you need prayer, there will be pastors up front. If not... Encourage you, enjoy a milkshake. If you can't enjoy a milkshake, buy somebody else a milkshake, right? But man, may we cling to what is good. Cling to what is good. Are you clinging to the Word of God? Are you allowing God's Word to be that sanctifying process over your life? You're just washing yourself and washing yourself and washing yourself. Are you too busy being so much in the world and in the things of it, you're just getting yourself dirtier and dirtier and dirtier? So, Lord, we just thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for tonight. Again, we thank you for the book of Deuteronomy. And, Lord, thank you for the promises you have for us, Lord. Uh, This promised land that we get to live in, Lord. A life of less and less sin, Lord. A life of closer unity to you. Lord, a life when we can hear your still, small voice, Lord. Lord, a life when we don't have to be worried about what people know about us or the things that we're doing. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this blessed life of being freed from sin and freed from hell and freed from shame. Lord, we thank you so much for it. And Lord, just thank you. We thank you for your mercy and grace upon us, Lord, that when we sin and when we mess up, Lord, Lord, thank you that you don't just destroy us, you don't just get rid of us, Lord. Ah, Lord, but how your mercy and grace, it tells us to get back up again, to repent and get back in track with you, Lord. So, Lord, that's our prayer for any brother, any sister here, Lord. If they've fallen off track, Lord, if, if they've sinned, may they not allow the enemy, Lord, to just condemn them and beat them up and cause them to run away, Lord. Lord, but may they allow your conviction to settle in, Lord, that they'd repent and go and sin no more, Lord. So we just love you, Lord. We thank you so much. Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.